First of all, I guess uh, a little bit of background about myself. Um, been in the condition monitoring field for, oh, I guess a little over 17 years now. Um, probably, the, probably the last six and a half years with Allied Reliability. Um, for the last two year, two and a half years, I was, I've the, been the director of, uh, excuse me, the director of mechanical services for Allied. So, like I said, in my condition monitoring, I guess, background, you know, I've had an opportunity to play with just about all the technologies. And uh, what we're going to kind of talk about today is the human side. Because what we'll find is that uh, different industries, different facilities have put in place, there are a lot of common factors. So this afternoon, I guess for the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to talk about those common factors, pitfalls, I guess, for uh, applied condition monitoring programs and kind of centered around the human factor. Um, personal competency, personnel turnover, that's, uh, that's, that continues to be a big issue. The part-time predictive maintenance technician, we're gonna spend some time on that. Then we're gonna, we're gonna look at, uh, I guess, an inappropriate response to uh, identified defects. So, Basically, how are we reacting to the information that our condition monitoring technologies are providing? And then finally, the, the last piece is centered around program design, application, and what are, what are the appropriate uh, coverage levels. I guess, first of all, uh, personnel competency. You know, oftentimes, when we have a facility that's, that's just starting their condition monitoring journey, it's, it's due to the fact that there are a couple of people that are... You know, they, they went to a conference, they read some, read some interesting articles, and they saw, hey, this condition monitoring stuff, this is, you know, this is cool stuff, this could really help. Oftentimes it starts out with, I guess, an, an introductory level of application. Okay, so, so those individuals will they'll go out and they'll, they'll participate in a couple of, uh, uh, couple of training sessions, maybe acquire a level one certification. And those individuals are typically the only the only folks on site that that understand what the uh, I guess the the capabilities of the technologies that they're that they're trying to employ. But there's there's uh, little to no buy-in at a corporate corporate level. What we find is in order to in order to build the buy-in, in order to to develop um, consistency and effectiveness in your condition monitoring programs. There are a couple of key ingredients. It's real important to develop standards, both from a personnel standpoint and a technology standpoint. Uh, I'll give you an example. I've had an opportunity to participate in a, in a number of assessment type activities. Where we'll go into a site and we'll review their, their existing programs and see where they compare to best practice applications. During that process, we you know, get to interview interview folks, and uh, and gauge the general level of uh, level of competency, and knowledge, background, and on one particular occasion, I had uh, I met up with an individual who um, he just came back from a it was a vendor provided vibration analysis class, and he. His takeaway from that class, they, they, they talked about waveform alarms and the importance of waveform alarms, and if they're not using them, they should be using them. Well, this particular individual, he, he kind of took that and ran with it. There was really no MOC process in place at his facility. He was, you know, he was the one guy, he was in charge of his program, and so he, he comes back from that session, and he eliminates the alarms that were in place, and he put in place what he what he thought was an additional waveform peak-to-peak -peak alarm. In essence, what he did is he created overall alarms, so he didn't add to the existing the existing alarm uh, alarm platform that they have had in place in the uh, in the tools, but he removed it and added an incorrect alarm, and then. You know, it was probably two, three months down the road. He's starting to see some, starting to see some failures, and he couldn't figure out why. And 
the reason why is he, is he basically he uh, he adversely affected the the technology setup based on you know based on a one-off training class. That's why it's real real important that that we put in place standards that that ensure that the folks that have the capability to uh, to perform program design changes, if you will, they have the appropriate knowledge and background and experience. So we need to develop standards, let's say for a vibration analyst as an example. Um, when we get to a lead analyst, lead analyst type application, that individual maybe should be a minimum level two analyst before he can make any, any database changes. Okay. Um, we also want to have the same thing with technology standards. In other words, from soup to nuts, you know, how are we going to apply our program, right? And we want to make sure that there's a good valid MOC process in place that gets vetted with appropriate, uh, through appropriate knowledgeable personnel before we can make any changes. We want to make sure that those individuals who are associated with our condition monitoring programs, they, they have a good personal development plan, okay? We look for education, we look for certification, we look for experience. Those all need to be spelled out within, within the standards document that we put in place. And then finally, we need to focus on really what, what's the best practice uh, program implementation. What does that look like? Oftentimes what we see is it's someone's, someone's gut feel. You know, I, I really like this technology. I heard from this vendor that, that this technology is, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna cover all the necessary failure modes, right? Well, that, you know, that may or may not be reality. So what we need to do is we need to identify what you know, what does a best practice implementation look like? And we need to create the appropriate process and procedures to develop that. This is just an example of uh, an OP2 standard. Again, OP2 standard for technology, it should spell out from soup to nuts, how do I develop my database? Okay. What are my collection parameters? What are my alarm parameters based on certain, certain equipment types? Just every aspect of that applied technology should be developed, and there should be a process and procedure in place that our folks need to follow. That takes the ambiguity out of, out of the, the, the program implementation. Okay? That, that ensures that as long as we have individuals who are certified, qualified, and trained, as long as they have the appropriate level of experience and knowledge, they can perform that task consistently and effectively. And that's, that's going to generate positive results. One of the other issues that we that we run into with uh, with new program development or actually you know, it's probably not true in, in all existing programs what happens is we you know we start bringing those folks up to speed they become competent in their applied condition monitoring technologies okay, and they become a valuable valuable commodity how many folks you know have uh, condition monitoring programs in place where where they have individuals working for them that are uh, that that have received external job offers. It's it's pretty common. The you know there's not a lot of folks out there that that have the background that we look for for condition monitoring activities. So they're they're a sought after commodity. You know, Allied Reliability hires uh, you know quite a few individuals on an annual basis for, and we're looking for you know we're looking for the uh, uh, experience background formal certifications. What we found though is we're subject to the same, the same circumstances. Our individuals who we bring on board, we train, we, and we bring them up to speed in, in the allied philosophies of the way we, way we incorporate our condition monitoring activities. They're valuable folks. If we found that if we don't if we don't create an environment where that fosters continuous improvement, provides them with additional training and additional opportunities, we're going to lose those folks. So I guess the key takeaway here is it's, it's important to ensure, one, that we're getting quality individuals, it's two, to recognize that they're valuable individuals, and three, to put in place a, a continuous improvement plan to help retain those individuals. We found that if they're happy, if they're, if they're challenged, they're generally happy, and they're going to stay. One of the other things that we see quite often is um, facilities that, that want to start condition monitoring programs, 
but don't necessarily want to dedicate or, or want to apply dedicated resources for those activities. So we'll look for a, a maintenance mechanic or, uh, or an electrician, someone who's, who's got you know, some, some time and experience at that facility, knows the equipment, and we will bless them as the PDM technician. So whether it be VIBE, whether it be UE, whether it be IR, whatever the case, you know, this individual is now blessed as the condition monitoring expert. Problem is they don't free them up to do that job, right? So what happens is as soon as we have uh, an emergency or demand maintenance event, as soon as something unexpected happens and we don't have the appropriate maintenance personnel to take care of that, you know, supervision says, hey, remember Joe, the guy that was doing, the guy that is now doing condition monitoring, you know, he knows that equipment. He was an expert on that equipment. Let's, let's pull him, let's have him work on it. The issue here is, is by doing that, it, it sends the wrong message and it diminishes the benefits of your applied condition monitoring program because you're taking them away from doing the things, uh, applying the condition monitoring activities that are gonna identify the, the defects early. So we advocate early detection, early correction. You're pulling him, away, pulling him away from those activities, right, to perform, perform emergency or demand maintenance. We never then receive the information that we need to identify these things before they actually uh, become emergency and demand activities. So by pulling him, okay, we're defeating the purpose of, of the applied condition monitoring activities. It promotes, rea it promotes reactive maintenance. It also inhibits you know, recognizing the full value of the condition monitoring activity because what we find is uh, there's no buy-in. They don't see the value because if we're not applying the technologies, if we're not, if, if we're not incorporating early, de early detection, early correction, okay, then the, the thought is going to be that, hey, this, this condition monitoring, this stuff, is, this stuff doesn't work. Well, it's not that this stuff doesn't work. It's, it's that we're not allowing the activities to take place to demonstrate that it will work. We're not reacting appropriately. And then finally, the last, the last piece, once we identify, or once we apply solid condition monitoring activities, we become proactive. We see a reduction in emergency or demand maintenance, that we see less downtime, right? We have all these resources that were previously identified and dedicated to preventive maintenance activity, emergency demand maintenance. If we shift the focus from those activities to predictive condition monitoring activities, okay, we actually free up those resources that we can then assign to other maintenance and reliability initiatives, whether it be you know, we need another planner, whether it be we need, uh, we need someone doing root cause analysis, we need, you know, we need someone focused on, focused on scheduling. Whatever the case may be, there's, there's a whole host of, of activities that that are included within your maintenance and reliability initiatives by applying condition monitoring activities in place of preventive maintenance strategies, you realize, you realize additional resources that you can apply to those activities. How many people in the room have, uh, I guess, uh, perform condition monitoring activities, provide recommendations? Have you ever seen any of these comments? When you identify an issue, and you write up a condition entry, you, you communicate that issue to the powers that be at your facility. Have you seen any of these responses? How long will it last? I wanna get the most runtime possible out of the equipment before I will take action. I wanna work on it just before it fails. Then you, you go to the next step and you explain, it's already failed, we've identified a defect, that's, that's, that piece of equipment has functionally failed. You make that statement, they understand it, but they still want, they still wanna get the most runtime out of it so they want you to monitor it more frequently. Then the final bullet, won't the technologies predict time to failure? I'll tell you what, if I, if I could predict with some level of accuracy the, the time of final de demise, the time at which your equipment blows up, okay, I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing. I'd be in Las Vegas. 
I'd be, I'd be a lot better off financially because in truth, we can't predict that, right? We can, we can identify when there are issues. We can assess severity, but the actual time of demise, that's not a valid expectation. And what we find is, you know, the facilities that, that have the, these types of response, responses to issues, I guess inappropriate responses to issues, they're immature, okay? They're, they're very early on in their, in their proactive maintenance initiatives, okay? And they're not going to realize the most benefit out of their applied condition monitoring activities. How many people have seen this graphic before? It's nothing new, it's a, it's a PF curve. What this, what this graph represents is the point at which a defect is identified. The takeaway from this is early on the curve, that's where your condition monitoring predictive maintenance activities are going to be able to identify the warning signs of a defect. As we progress down that failure curve, that's when we get into the preventive maintenance realm. That's where something is, you know, it's, it's noisy, it's, it's hot to the touch, okay? There's, there's measurable, measurable looseness. That's much further down the failure progression curve. Then finally, if we take it all the way down to the end, that's the run to failure maintenance strategy. That's the point at which that piece of equipment finally stops. The thing to note here is the cost of repair, right? The cost of repair is up to 10 times Standard, standard maintenance costs, and that does not include downtime if we, if we run a machine to failure. I like to talk about a little, little example to prove my point with regard to inappropriate response to condition entries. Let's look at vibration analysis as the, as the, uh, as the technology for detection. As an analyst, I go in, I take a set of readings, I perform my analysis, and I see evidence of misalignment, right? My recommendation may be, you know, noted increased two-time running speed component. This is an indication of misalignment. Check the coupling for condition and alignment and correct as necessary, right? If we're a mature organization, okay, once I give them that recommendation, the response isn't gonna be how long will it last? The response will be, okay, great. We'll get it, we'll get it planned, we'll get it scheduled, we'll get it done. If they do that work, when they receive that, that initial condition entry, we're looking at what, maybe two hours worth of work? Fair assessment? Then uh, maybe we have to replace a coupling insert. On the flip side, if, if the response is, no, we're not gonna work on that now, how long will it last, if you will? We're gonna get the most runtime. Maybe the next time I come back and take a set of readings, now I see varying defect frequencies. Okay, well the challenge there is they're not gonna heal. Okay. So now the, the maintenance is going to include replacing the bearings. Okay. Oh yeah, and by the way, once you have it apart, once you're doing the maintenance activity, check the alignment. Okay. And we can we can take that all the way down to a catastrophic failure, but again it illustrates the you know the the scenario that as we progress down that failure curve, our maintenance costs increase. And then the other, the other thing you lose as you progress down that failure curve is the ability to identify the root cause of the actual failure. In this case, in the example that, that I started, misalignment was the root cause. Okay, if we reacted appropriately, we knew that. We can focus then the appropriate corrective action, if you will, whether it be whether it be training for the maintenance craft, whether it be giving them some precision alignment tools, whether, whether it be putting in place some standards on what's acceptable, we can address that issue. One of the other things we see very frequently is, I guess, uh, issues with regard to technology applications and what's right from a coverage level standpoint. And if we look at this from the human factor, from the human standpoint, a lot of times, especially with uh, initial program design, okay, that's done by gut feel. Again, I, I heard this technology is good. This is, what I, this is what I am going to deploy. Okay. Again, it may be right. You know, there, 
Some technologies address more failure modes than others, okay? But it shouldn't be based on a gut feel. What we need to do is we need to design that and what, design that based on the failure modes inherent in the components and parts that make up the asset base, asset that we're monitoring, and we're gonna to touch on that a little bit later. Real quick, I wanted to talk about, along with that, we need to identify what the appropriate maintenance strategy is. Not sure how many of you may have seen this graph. I guess around 1996, 1997, John Schultz, uh, he's one of the founders of Allied. He worked for Eli Lilly at the time. Eli Lilly says, okay, we want to expand our condition monitoring program. But the question arose, what technology and how much? So what any, what any small you know, pharmaceutical facility would do uh, when money was, you know, was not an issue, they commissioned a, a benchmark study. So what they did is uh, they, they collected data from, it was no fewer than five companies, 20 different facilities, so 100, different, uh, 100 data points for multiple industry verticals. Then they hired a couple statisticians and they crunched the numbers, right? What we found when we crunched the numbers is that, that they can draw some very valid conclusions. Up here in the right-hand corner is a correlation coefficient. The closer to one, is, closer to one you get is better. Anything above, I, I believe it's 0.8, is, uh, means it's st st statistically relevant, and two items are directly associated with one another. What they found when they crunched these numbers is, this is an example of vibration analysis. As we applied vibration analysis to the equipment that that technology was applicable for, as we increased the coverage levels, we saw a reduction in maintenance costs. And what they, what they looked at there is, uh, is percentage of maintenance against replacement asset value. And they chose that metric because everyone could, every one of the facilities that they, they <coughs> captured data on, that was a metric that they could provide. That was their insurance provider could, uh, could provide them with with what replacement asset cost was, and they knew what their maintenance costs were. But again, as we increased coverage levels, we saw that, that our maintenance costs decreased. Why would that be? What's different about condition monitoring activities? When do you collect the data? Is the, the equipment's in operation? Okay, it's, it's, it's non-intrusive. Based on that, we collect data. We're not shutting, we're not shutting equipment down. There's, there's no production loss associated with that. Okay, what about maintenance? When do we perform the maintenance? When we identify an issue, right? So, it's, so it eliminates time-based replacement and reconditioning, which may not be applicable depending on the failure mode, but it eliminates that and we, it allows us to focus our, our maintenance activities only when needed. Increases in production, decrease in parts and labor. Because we're identifying things early on the failure curve, we're seeing, seeing less reactive emergency or demand maintenance. So again, more uptime, more production. And this is actually the same graph, but, but we're looking at preventive maintenance tasks. And what we saw was, again, the correlation coefficient is very close to one. It's statistically significant that they're related. We saw that there was an increase in cost when we, based on the number of PMs that we performed, that affected our maintenance costs, right? If it's, if it's written correctly, what, what is a PM supposed to do? It's an inspection, right? It's, it's meant to, to evaluate a piece of equipment okay, on a time basis. So it's geared towards time-based replace, replacement or reconditioning. So it's only good for failure modes that aren't random. Why would there be increased costs? What, typically, what state is your, is your equipment in when we're performing a PM? Potentially, we're, we're replacing parts as well. So we're taking something apart and we're putting it together. That equipment is down, so we have production loss time-based replacement reconditioning, so we have increased costs due to parts and labor, which may or may not be necessary. Okay. Then also, what happens when you take something apart and put it together? There you go. It introduces the opportunity for infant mortality failures. Okay. So for all those reasons, as we increase the number of PA, PMs at your facility, can you see why realistically our maintenance costs go up? And again, if we, look at, if we look at the failure curve, our preventive maintenance strategies are gonna identify things further down the failure curve, right? So what we wanna do with that failure curve, with our technologies, we wanna eliminate the ambiguity, okay? We want to use our technologies 
we want to we want to focus on early detection, early correction, okay, and we want the right behaviors ingrained at the site so that they react as early as possible. When you do that, that's when you see the biggest return on your maintenance investment. This is just uh, an illustration of, of some of the other technologies. Again, the same, the same holds true. Any condition monitoring technology as you increase the coverage levels okay, based on and apply it to the assets that it's applicable to, so the failure modes that are inherent in the parts and components that make up those assets, as you increase your coverage levels, you can see a you can expect a reduction in maintenance costs. This graphic should look familiar to, to probably pretty much everyone in the room. This was uh, actually a study done by uh, Nolan and Heap in the airline industry, and they looked at failure patterns and you know, whether or not they were infant mortality, whether or not they were random, whether or not they were wear out type failures. And what we see. If we look, if we think back to the graphics that I showed previously, increased costs due to P, due to applied PMs, decreased maintenance costs with with increased condition monitoring, preventive maintenance activities. That works for us because age-related failures, PMs, will identify. Those should be targeted as time-based replacement or reconditioning activities for age-related failures. Random failures are condition monitoring activities are what will identify the defects. This is just another graphic to kind of illustrate that point. This is, this is a study that was done by SKF. And uh, what they did is they took 30 bearings, identical, and they oversped them, overloaded them, and they ran them to failure. Based on this information, just bearing one through 30 across the bottom and the number of hours until they failed, Based on this information, at what time frequency would you implement a preventive maintenance strategy in order to avoid bearing failures? It's a trick question because there, uh, again, this illustrates <laughs> how to, why condition monitoring is applicable to random failures because there is no good time that you can, that you can devise from this graphic, okay? You can, you can, create a preventive maintenance strategy and you can replace them on the hour, but wouldn't be cost effective and wouldn't help you one bit. Again, we want to take the ambiguity away from program design. So the human factor, what, what technology and how much, right? One of the ways that we do that is through failure mode analysis. There's a lot of tools that you can use for that. Uh, RCM activities, failure modes and effects analysis, um, we, we have some tools within Allied that have failure mode mapping capability and what that does is it looks at, again, the failure modes inherent in the components and parts that make up your asset and literally it's a check in the box which condition monitoring technology is applicable to identifying those, identifying those failure modes. Now, with this information we generate what we call an EMP, Equipment Maintenance Plan. So it's, it's basically a, a playbook for each piece of equipment based on the failure mode information. And it says, okay, these technologies are applicable. Now, we decide what to apply based on a criticality that's, that's been performed at the site. So on our critical equipment, we, you know, we assign multiple technologies. You know, some of these technologies overlap. We, we might apply vibration analysis, UE, okay? motor circuit testing, IR, to our, to our top critical equipment. And as we, as we progress down the, the criticality ranking, okay, then we eliminate some of the technologies, maybe we only focus one. Or if the criticality value is low enough, we employ a run-to-failure maintenance strategy, but it is, a, it is a designed decision, takes the ambiguity out. And the other thing the EMP allows us to do is everywhere where there is a condition monitoring activity that's been identified and applied, great. As long as, it as long as it covers those, covers all the failure modes, we can we can remove those preventive maintenance activities, okay, and identify resources that we can apply in our other maintenance and reliability initiatives. Where we don't have technologies applied, that's where we have to write a preventive maintenance strategy so that we can cover those failure modes. We'll kind of cover this real quick. Again, the the question is how much, based on 
that based on that benchmark study that I that I discussed earlier, we've we've come up with some percentages that um, that we would label as best practice application levels. Okay, so in other words, if you remember the the co correlation coefficients and 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 the cost benefit, we have a reduction in cost as we increase the coverage levels. But we get to a point where where there's a roll off and we don't see a further further reduction. For vibration analysis in the chemical industry, that's around 88%, okay, just as an example. So that 88% then would be a first quartile or best practice number. 100% theoretical is you give me an asset list with 5,000 assets, okay, I run it through our failure mode mapping and I say, okay, of those 5,000 assets, 3,400 of them, Vibe is applicable for, okay. Best practice is 2,720 of those 5,000 assets, let's say. And then we take that percentage and we just break it up in quarters from there. And the reason we do this is, you know, it's kind of like that old adage, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. The goal is to apply, is to continue to increase your coverage levels for the individual technologies, okay, and increase the applied technologies. So the goal is to continue to apply condition monitoring activities, right? But if we went first quartile with Vibe, first quartile with UE, um, you know, maybe third quartile with motor current testing, the issue that we that we may be faced with is the fact that all these condition entries, the facility receives this information, but their work management system isn't mature enough. Okay, they're you know they're not proactive enough to handle those handle those uh, condition entries. So that forces them down the bad path of how long it, how long can it wait, and I got to focus my activities. And if they're not correcting it, right, we're not getting the benefit out of our applied condition monitoring technologies. So again, it's it's all in the design. Remove the human factor, remove the ambiguity. You know, we just talked about, or I just I just mentioned that that the goal is to continue to increase our coverage levels, right? We're going to focus our precision maintenance practices right, to ensure that the work that's done is done right. And we're going to start to see an improvement in, in our asset health metrics. What happens, we, we should set some goals and targets. Let's say it's 90%. We get to a point where, where we can achieve 90% asset health and sustain that for, let's say, three cycles, three months. Okay. It's at that point that, that we can say, okay, now we're ready to pull the trigger and increase our coverage levels, okay? Because our because we know that our work management process is able to keep up with the condition entries that we're writing. All the applied technologies are broken out separately. If any one of them turns red or there's an issue uh, detected in one technology, the overall asset health turns red. So just some, I guess, some closing thoughts. You know, the right technology in the wrong hands. It's important to have buy-in and understanding of the technologies. It's, it's important to incorporate a failure mode based methodology for determining the maintenance strategies. Again, keep the ambiguity out. It's, it's not my gut feel on, on what technology and how much. Adopt, recognize best practice methodologies for the application and response to defect identification strategies. In other words, don't play that how long will it last game. You, okay, if you play that game, you're going to lose and you're not going to realize the the, the most potential out of your applied condition monitoring programs. Ensure that qualified individuals are performing these tasks. And then finally, just consider all the pitfalls that we've discussed during this presentation. Questions, comments? You, you were saying about the, uh, have we heard these statements before? Mm -hmm. I have a new one for you. I want to see the raw data. <laughs> you, oh, I yeah. gave him the raw data and that's not what I wanted. Yep. You didn't understand. I have heard that statement once or twice, and usually that is a stalling tactic. <laughs> yeah. I hear what you're saying. I'm not ready to react. Yep. Those are the facilities that, that haven't heard of infant mortality failures. And, uh, and I guess I would ask, you know, what's, your, what's your acceptance testing and accreditation program look like? Oftentimes it's non-existent. Thank you.